in the way of a lay led or uh, evening sermon, however you want to look at this uh, tonight, uh, this evening, whenever you're watching it, uh, I wanted to look at John chapter 11 uh, tonight, uh, verses 1 through 57, pretty much the whole uh, chapter, specifically verses 1 through 45. Uh, are the narrative of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, not Lazarus, Lazarus, uh, one that many, many of us are familiar with. Many of you probably uh, taught in a Sunday school class. And I'm sure I had it uh, in a Sunday school class when I was very young. Uh, it usually makes that cycle. But my first remembrance of this story uh, actually comes from uh, a song that came out of the contemporary Christian music genre uh, when that was just getting started in the mid uh, to late 80s and it was a song by the artist Carmen and it was called Lazarus Come Forth and it's this dramatic and dare I say uh, overproduced uh, kind of pop song attempt at uh, this narrative to get out the story of, of Lazarus but uh, in the song Lazarus is kind of gathered in this other place I don't know if it's supposed to be a purgatory or what it is, but it's a gathering of, of saints of old and, and Abraham speaks and David speaks. And then it comes to Lazarus and he talks about this personal interaction uh, that he's had with Jesus. He says, I knew him in a way you all never did. And as he is kind of there, this deep booming voice comes in and says, Lazarus. And Lazarus begins, uh, continues to speak. Uh, to the other people around and says, you know, I, it's almost like I just hear him right now. And you hear, Lazarus. And then the speaker uh, of Lazarus says, Jesus. And then there's this really, I'm, I'm trying to be tactful, but odd uh, exchange in the song where uh, the produced voice is, Lazarus, Jesus, Lazarus, Jesus, Lazarus. And it goes on uh, like that. And I think Again, I, I was all in it when I was a, when I was a kid, and I know it's a song that uh, for some, and maybe even some watching this who are familiar with, uh, has a deep meaning. I, I think the song gets the dramatic interplay between uh, the life that God calls us to and, and, and out of death in the story of Lazarus, but it's, it's probably a little cheesy. It, what it does miss is the tenderness of this story. Uh, it drives us to look uh, into, the, into the scripture and, and maybe that's why it's a good thing that it, it takes us back uh, to scripture. And in John chapter 11, John uses the story of Lazarus, this friend of Jesus, along with his sisters, uh, this deep, intimate friend of Jesus. And it functions as a sign of the true identity of Jesus as the resurrection and the life. This is where that powerful statement comes from. It functions as moving in the narrative as the as sort of the tipping point uh, for many of the teachers of the law and many of those uh, within that group uh, that were um, angry and were pursuing uh, action against Jesus. It, it brings up for them the charge of blasphemy, this claim upon his upon his part. Uh, geographically, it gets us closer uh, to uh, Jerusalem as Jesus begins that ultimate pursuit of uh, physically, but of the mission that defined his whole uh, incarnation, uh, that mission to the cross. So I wanted to look at John chapter 11 uh, tonight and also what it tells us about Jesus and, and hopefully an encouraging word uh, as we see Christ in this albeit miraculous story, but a very relatable uh, story as, as well. So this is what we can know. Mary and Martha and Lazarus live uh, perhaps in their parents' home who have passed away, uh, but they live in Bethany, which is outside of Jerusalem. I, I think of it in a term that I was not familiar with until we moved to Dallas early on in our marriage. And all of those kind of little towns around the Dallas-Fort Worth area that are no, not little towns anymore, um, many of them would be referred to as bedroom communities. And maybe uh, you're familiar with that, with that term. And um, certainly towns in Oklahoma uh, could be thought of as some of them as bedroom communities 
So these are towns that kind of serve as opportunities for people to have housing and, and perhaps yards and, and those kind of things while remaining close uh, to, to their work, to where uh, kind of the center of, of uh, business and those kind of things happen. So uh, we lived near McKinney, which at the time uh, was considered maybe a bedroom community uh, for Dallas. Uh, now it's kind of its city on, on, all by itself. But, but the idea that these little towns, these suburbs, uh, serve as bedroom communities for these bigger towns. Bethany was in many ways uh, a bedroom community. The term that John uses for it, village, is only used one other time to refer to Bethlehem. So it's a small town, but its proximity to a larger town uh, makes it a popular, a popular place. Jesus, many times when he was going into Jerusalem, would stay uh, in Bethany, presumably uh, with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so they're living in Bethany, and Lazarus becomes sick. Many scholars uh, think that at this time Jesus was in the village or the city of Betna, uh, north and east of Jerusalem, about a hundred miles away. So the timeline would work out like this: Jesus receives word uh, that Lazarus is sick from uh, from a friend or from some uh, some kind of train of messages. Uh, he waits two days. And then he and the disciples, as he says, we are going to Judea, which they're not excited about uh, because the persecution and accusations against Jesus have amped up. And the last time he was in that area, uh, there was no small, uh, no small fear. And so the disciples are thinking, is this really a good idea? And Thomas even says, let us go that we might die with him. And is it talking about dying with Jesus or along with Lazarus being dead. In any way, it's an ominous tone for this trip. So they begin the journey. It would take about four days. And so by the time they get to Bethany, uh, Lazarus has been dead uh, for four days. Presumably, Jesus heard about him being sick. He wasn't dead yet. He is now dead and has been dead for four days. As he arrives into town, before he even gets into Bethany, he's met with Martha. And in verse 21, she says the phrase that, is echoed by her sister Mary, which I think is so interesting, and says more than just the statement. It communicates uh, emotion. It communicates um, theology. It communicates in some way doubt when she says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Mary says in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Martha puts a caveat in verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Is this a sense of hope? Is this a sense of maybe there's a little more? Do some, We're not really sure. She, she confesses after Jesus says, your brother will rise again. She says, yes, I know he will rise in the resurrection uh, at the last day. So it doesn't necessarily seem that she is thinking he will give you whatever you ask if you ask him to bring back uh, Lazarus from the dead. But there is still uh, a glimmer of hope. Lazarus is a friend. There is a deep friendship here. We um, are told in the, in the very beginning, the one whom you love is sick. Uh, later on in his weeping, the shortest verse in uh, the New Testament scriptures, verse 35, Jesus wept. The one I always tried to, the, one I, the first verse I memorized, uh, Jesus wept. There was a deep, intimate connection here. One scholar points out that what was deeper was after he is told that Lazarus is sick and the one he has loved, then it says God will be glorified. So what motivated his love for Lazarus and his even love for his friends and his love for all was that God could show up. His greater love was the glory of God. His greater love was his connection. And that... Um, called or that motivated all of his other loves. Lazarus was a friend. So he goes in and after the conversation with Mary and Martha and he defies human reasoning and human logic and calls Lazarus out of the grave. It's a momentous uh, occasion, a dramatic occasion, a miraculous uh, occasion even.
what I think we see about Jesus in this passage and what I think we can be encouraged by and be reminded of today is that he hears. Word came to him that Lazarus was sick. Now this blend between Jesus' humanity and his divinity, did he already know in his spirit that his friend was sick? All of those, that divine foreknowledge and all of those kind of things, perhaps so, but he hears. So God, Christ does not just ask us to talk as kind of a formality. He asks us to come to him because he hears. We are called to expressing groanings only the Holy Spirit can translate because he hears. We are called because he listens. He hears. He is motivated by glorifying God, nothing else. Jesus does not come and heal Lazarus because it will make him more popular. In fact, it goes the other direction in some ways. Jesus does not come to heal Lazarus so Mary and Martha will like him more. He comes in the pursuit of the glory of God, that God might show up. And in our motivation to exemplify Christ, may it be that God might be glorified and God might be honored. Yes, it's great when people recognize us for doing good things, and, and that's okay, but we're reminded throughout the New Testament not to let that go to our head, but that our heart's desire might be to glorify and honor God, and we see that in Jesus. Often Jesus answers our questions with deeper ones. Implicit in Martha's declaration of verse 21 and then her conviction of verse 22, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. And he asks the question, do you believe this? Often when Jesus hears us, often when the glory of God is about to show up in our lives and in the lives of others, amidst our questions and our doubts, that he hears also. Jesus asks of us deeper questions. Martha, I appreciate that you can recite that I am the Son of God and that God will give me whatever I ask. But do you believe this? That they will live even though they die. Calling Martha in her relationship to a deeper level, calling upon her convictions and deepening her knowledge and our knowledge as well. Finally, Jesus calls us out. When he calls Lazarus from the grave, he says, he comes out and he says, take his grave clothes off of him and let him go. As Jesus hears our cry, as Jesus hears our petitions, as Jesus answers our questions with deeper questions, calling us to something more. As the glory of God is prepared, as we pursue it, he calls us out. He might be calling you to a phone call. He might be calling you to kneel. In Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most just when I need him Jesus is true never forsaking all the way through giving for birth Just, just when I need him most. Just, just when I need him most. 
just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. Just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long. Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most Jesus is near to comfort and cheer Just when I need Him most just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call. Tenderly watching, lest I should fall. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. You may be like Mary and Martha in some ways. Lord, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. He is here. Jesus is here to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Thank you.